Last week on this channel, we spoke about Notre Dame and the legend behind the Devil's Door. While researching the Devil's Door, I stumbled upon another story that some could say is a mystery. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. I also, as always, want to give a very special thank you to all our patrons. We have picked up even more patrons, and I am so appreciative of all you guys. If it was not for you, we would not be able to continue what we do. So thank you so much much. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today on Mystery Monday we are going to be talking about the crown of thorns. Now before we get into the story, I just wanted to give a very special welcome to all of my new subscribers here at this community. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We've had a crazy few weeks. Last week, as you all know, I went on the Charlie Ward show. I'm always on David Zublick's show on Tuesdays. And then I had the awesome opportunity to have Janine from Tarot by Janine on my show last week, along with our friend Tom Numbers, who's on the channel a lot. I could not be more excited about all the friendships that I have made throughout this journey. And I cannot wait to get to know all the new subscribers as we all move through this crazy time period in our lives. For those who are new to this channel, typically what I do is I'm a storytelling channel. So what I will do is I will go back throughout the history, I'll comb the history books and find very interesting stories that could have more to them that meets the eye. For those of us who are awake, are red-pilled, as they say, we know that the history we've been taught is frankly not true. And so I try to uncover stories that would indicate the truth of what actually happened, including the Canaanites that rule our world today. We are currently exploring French history, especially with the French royal family and their ties to alleged satanic rituals. But if you scroll through the channel, you will find other countries. I've done a deep dive into the English royal family. I am related to the English royal family. My great, great, great grandfather was born into that family. You'll also find other stories on blood types and all sorts of fringe topics that aren't typical in our educational system. All right, so let's get into the crown of thorns. So the crown of thorns was the crown that was worn by Jesus Christ when he was crucified. Most people are familiar with this story. It's considered the passion of the Christ. Now you can find the story of the crown of thorns in the canonized Bible, but you can also find the story in some of the heretical books that were left out of the Bible. And if you do join us on Tuesdays with David Zublick, you will be familiar with all of these books we've gone through, especially with the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, which is the Gospel we've been focused on for a few months now. So as many people know, the crown of thorns was placed upon Jesus' head during his crucifixion. It was supposed to kind of mock, be a mockery, because he considered himself to be the king of the Jews. And this crown of thorns was thorny, so it pierced inside of his head while he was also nailed to a cross. Now obviously this happened about 2,000 years ago. And to be honest with you all, I've never even thought about the possibility of the crown of thorns or other objects from the crucifixion still being around today. Again, it was 2,000 years ago. I also grew up Presbyterian, and in the Protestant churches, we don't really have relics like maybe you would find in the Catholic churches. Well, when I was researching the Devil's Door of Notre Dame from last week, which I will include a link to that down in the description box below if you have not seen it, I realized that people believe the crown of thorns is still here and has been at Notre Dame all these years. Well, it's not at Notre Dame anymore. You see, after the fire, 
last or in 2019 like two years ago they ended up moving the crown of thorns to the louvre but how did the supposed crown of thorns end up in paris france of all places after all i don't believe jesus ever was in paris france and he was crucified in jerusalem if you have been following along with us on the Dark Outpost, as we go through all these banned books of the Bible, you will know that we have looked at the early stages of the Christian faith. Before the Council of Nicaea, which happened in the 4th century with the Emperor Constantine, the Christian faith was like a Gnostic school. It was very yogic. It was very focused on spirituality. There was no organized state religion in the beginning. Again, not until the Council of Nicaea. Now, when the Council of Nicaea happened in the 4th century, that's when the canonized Bible was put together and they got rid of a ton of other works only to allegedly be held in the Vatican Library and obviously some have been buried that they've been found now, like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library, etc, etc, etc. But for that first 300 years, we're looking at the disciples going out and spreading this message all over into India and the Middle East and up into Europe, into France and over into Alexandria and Egypt. However, we don't know what actually happened to the crown of thorns or any other items that were there when Jesus was crucified. It's not mentioned in any other works of, of these disciples. But we do know by 400 AD, so going into the 5th century, that there was a crown of thorns that was venerated in Jerusalem. We don't really know how this crown of thorns came to be or if this was the actual crown of thorns. We do know that Jesus' brother James did have a temple or a church in Jerusalem. And could it be that that crown of thorns was brought to his church? Well, I don't know. We don't have any, any records of that. In fact, the first time we see the crown of thorns mentioned is in 409 AD. And this was mentioned by a man named St. Paulinus of Nola. Now, Nola is in the district of Italy. Now, St. Paulinus, he is an interesting character. He was a Roman senator, and he was married. In fact, it was his wife <clears throat> who encouraged him to get baptized, which is super fascinating, right? Because he was this bishop, and now we think of the uh, political employees or the employees of the Catholic Church as being celibate. But you see, in the beginning, they weren't. It was very common for these authority figures to actually be married. And again, his, his notes, his letters, are the first time we see the veneration of the crown of thorns being in Jerusalem. Another interesting thing about St. Paulinus is uh, he is the person that introduced bells into the Christian worship. And then if we skip forward to 570 AD-ish, around that time period, we have some documentation from a pilgrim who was from the northern part of Italy who made his way into the Holy Land of Jerusalem. He claimed that the crown of thorns was still at Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the hill that is right outside of Jerusalem to Calgary where Jesus was crucified. Now if we skip forward another 500 years or a little bit under 500 years to the year 1063, we see the crown of thorns or the supposed crown of thorns being moved to Constantinople. A lot was happening around this time. This is getting ready for and coming into the Crusades for the Holy Land. And so it's understandable that the Christians wanted to protect their relics. And so they moved this thing, this venerated crown of thorns, to Constantinople. During this time, it is also believed that some of the thorns were broken off of the crown of thorns and sent all over the European nations. That in itself is a totally different story that we can look into. I have a really hard time believing that a, a thousand year old crown at this time could handle being broken and not just totally fall apart. But anyway, you guys can leave your opinions on that down in the comments below. That's just a little wild to me. 
During the 13th century, Baldwin II became the emperor of Constantinople. Baldwin II is also known as Baldwin the Broke, and his financial situation is what gets the crown of thorns all the way up to Paris, France. Baldwin became the emperor of Constantinople when he was just 11 years old in the year 1228. His brother Robert died early and that is why this child ended up on the throne of a country that was pretty uh, financially broken. In fact, 12 years before Baldwin took the throne, so before Baldwin was even born in the year 1216, this empire was already on the decline because the Byz Byzantine Empire was crowding in trying to take the land. So this 11-year-old child, Baldwin, takes the throne with a country that's falling apart. You've got other nations, people, the Turks, coming in trying to take your land. You have no army. I mean, that's a lot of pressure for an 11-year-old. I know he had a regent, but that's still a lot of pressure for one person to inherit. This forced Baldwin to spend most of his time as the emperor going around to all the Europe, other European nations trying to get money, borrow money from these other kings and also to try to build an army so that he could potentially protect his country. In fact, Baldwin spent most of his time as the ruler so broke that he even sold his son Philip to some merchants. But Philip ends up reuniting with his father later on, but this story isn't really about Baldwin, but that just gives you an idea of how desperate this person was. So here we have Baldwin in Constantinople. He's going around all these European countries trying to get money, trying to get an army to protect his men. But there is something that Baldwin has that's very valuable to the European world at this time, and that is the crown of thorns. Baldwin ends up pawning off the crown of thorns to a Venetian bank for 13,134 hyperperia. I hope I'm saying that right. Now, at some point, King Louis IX of France steps in and takes over the crown of thorns and some other relics from Jesus' crucifixion that he buys off of Baldwin II. Now, an interesting side note, Baldwin II is Louis IX's cousin. Well, I guess that's not too interesting though because these royal families are all pretty much related. It's all bloodline. King Louis IX was a deeply religious man and he is the only French king to be canonized by the Catholic Church as a saint. This is also where we get the name of the city St. Louis from. For all intent and purposes, King Louis IX of France was a very good king. Under him, France was very, very wealthy and very, very strong. And in fact, King Louis himself funded two crusades in the Middle East to fight to get the Holy Land back. So for him, buying the crown of thorns and other religious relics from his cousin Baldwin probably seemed more like a duty because he was so deeply pious. And his cousin Baldwin needed the money. Well, when King Louis got the crown of thorns and some other relics, he ended up building a church specifically to house the crown of thorns and these relics. This was the St. Chapelle Church. But soon as Notre Dame would finish being built in the 14th century, as we spoke about in our last episode on Notre Dame, the crown of thorns was officially moved to Notre Dame where it ended up staying for like 700 years before the fire broke out again and they ended up moving it to the Louvre. Now, many people would take this story at face value, but I have a lot of questions. First of all, how do we know that this was the actual crown of thorns that Jesus wore? Again, there is like 300 years where we don't hear anything about these relics. The original Christians, the Gnostics, and the disciples didn't really seem to find these relics to be important. After all, it was more about Jesus' death and resurrection than the items that were there when it happened. 
As you all also know from other videos done on this channel, I am very skeptical of Constantine. In fact, in my opinion, Constantine the Great was never converted to the Christian faith. He was Mithraic. He was a Canaanite. And when he adapted the Christian faith into the Roman Empire, it was more to get people uh, to join his army so that he could, could take over all of the Roman Empire and have his own little new world order. And in fact, when he adapted the Christian faith into the state religion, he turned it into a Mithraic religion. He got rid of all the original Christian holidays and he turned like the Saturnalian holiday into Christmas. And he turned Passover into Easter. Easter was a pagan holiday at that time. There's a lot of murky stuff there that's very, very, very suspicious. I am also extremely distrustful of any royal family. I feel like I know too much about them to really take the history books at face value. So let's play devil's advocate and say that yes, this was the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. Why did Louis IX want them so badly? What was he going to do with them? Was there something nefarious or malevolent in his um, need for these relics. I'm also very skeptical about Notre Dame itself. As I said in the last video on Notre Dame, I have been there and I got a little uncomfortable. It was a bit scary. And I know you guys did say you wanted me to go into the gargoyles, which I am planning to do. I've already started my research search into the gargoyles. We know that Notre Dame was built on top of a pagan church that was built in honor of Jupiter. And this could all be very harmless. It could be nothing. It could just be a church that was built on some land where something else existed before. I, I don't know. I wasn't there. But deep in my gut, the whole thing just feels really icky. And on this Mystery Monday, I would love to know your thoughts on this. Now, my, my the thoughts around the Crown of Thorns or Notre Dame has nothing to do with the people of the Catholic faith or Christians in general. The people are people. The people are innocent in everything. My beef is with the powers that be. We know the powers that be have pulled the wool over our eyes for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and they've done some pretty evil things. And because of this, I'm suspect of the story as a whole. All right, guys, thank you so much for sitting through another video. I know I'm not in my normal place where I do my stories. It's just how it worked today. Normally, I do interviews with other people from my kitchen, and then I film the stories in the other part of the room by the bookshelf, but this is just how it worked out today, so I hope that's okay. Please don't forget that tomorrow night I'm back on with David Zublick on the Dark Outpost. We're doing the last section of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. I'm very sad to see this Gospel go, but we will be completing it tomorrow. And then we're going to be moving on to the Book of Q or Book of Cruel, which is our next Gospel to dig into and to try to discern. Thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link in the description box below. And thank you so much to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you guys. I hope that you all have a wonderful Monday and a wonderful week ahead. I will talk to you soon. Bye.